Good afternoon. My name is Glenn Jones, and it's my great pleasure to be interim dean of OISE. I also am joined by my colleagues here, Doug McDougall, who is our associate dean programs, and beside Doug is uh, Michelle Peterson Bedali, our associate dean research, international, and innovation. Um, let me tell you a little bit about what, what we're about. Um, the, our agenda really is, is I'm going to welcome you, which I've just done. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the overview and context of this process that we're going through, talk about the self-study, and then we'll move into the two major themes of today's conversation. We had a previous community consultation that focused on budget, finance, and resources, and today we're really talking about programs, about research international and innovation, which these are the two topics that correspond with the portfolios of my associate deans. Um, and they are key elements within the self-study process. And then we'll leave lots of space and time for questions and conversation. This is really a kind of sharing of information about the process and an opportunity for people to raise questions and to provide us with suggestions and comments as we move through this process. Um, a little bit about the context. As I think most of you know, Dean O'Sullivan's term completed and finished on June 30th. Um, it was announced that I would be interim dean as of March. And part of my responsibilities provided both by the provost and by uh, Dean O'Sullivan was to uh, begin a search process for a number of new senior administrative appointments within OISE. I'm very pleased, in fact, extraordinarily excited to be working with Doug and Michelle as our two new associate deans. And then we have a wonderful collection of department chairs. Uh, Abby uh, continues on within social justice education. Uh, Earl Woodruff is here in his, his new role as chair of the Applied Psychology and Human Development. Jim Hewitt is here in his role as interim chair of curriculum teaching and learning. Um, and Nina Bassia, I, I haven't seen you today, but Nina Bassia is our new chair of leadership higher and adult education. Um, so we have uh, primarily a new administrative team, uh, a lot of excitement, a lot of enthusiasm. And uh, we're, we're now working at sort of building a, a series of kind of key priorities. Um, we have a lot of priorities, but I think the ones that become most important, at least in the short term, are those about kind of strengthening communication with the noisy, uh, building community, and shifting the tone and tenor of decision making. And to some extent, this process is, is part of that. In other words, the notion of trying to be a bit more transparent about some of the issues and some of the facts and evidence with, that we know about the situation at OISE, trying to have greater participation within our community, putting ourselves out in terms of the sense of, of letting people know what we think are the serious issues and concerns and meeting with departments and, and going forward in a way that we think is as participatory and open as we possibly can be. Uh, we've tried very hard to make the deans and chairs the kind of centerpiece of decision making with the noisy. Um, and of course, there are always tensions and, and elements with these conversations, but we're trying very hard to, to sort of work closely with departments and build a kind of new tenor and tone of decision making within the institution. In terms of the specific review that we're, that's taking place, um, this review takes place under what's called the University of Toronto Quality Assurance Framework, and that is uh, every university in the province of Ontario has a quality assurance framework under a, under a broader umbrella of the Quality Council of Ontario. Um, this particular review is timed to coincide with the decanal search process. My appointment is as an interim dean. Uh, the, the, the provost is now um, uh, making decisions about the membership of the search process for the, the new dean. And the idea is that this review, among several functions, part of the objective of this review is to feed into that process by providing the search committee and what will be external reviewers with information about OISE and, and providing a sort of context and background report for that review. So clearly it fits in with the decanal review process, but that's not its only objective. It also fits within the governance process of the university. So this document will be filed uh, with the central administration of the university. There'll be a site visit that will take place in January. The dates have been settled. Um, and so that site visit will involve three senior leaders uh, of faculties of education internationally, one from Canada, one from the US, and one from Australia. Uh, those individuals will visit us. They will s submit a report. That report will become public. And at some point, uh, the OISE administration will be asked to comment on the comments within that report. And others were asked to provide feedback to contextualize that report. And all of these documents will then go through the governance process at the University of Toronto, because it's very much a kind of public reporting process, is to some extent what this is. Um, and so that's, that's how this fits in. It's both a kind of governance process in terms of ensuring that the institution has an opportunity to learn about OISE, the institution being the University of Toronto, but it also fits very naturally into the provostial search process for the next dean of OISE. In terms of the process itself, 
Um, as I said before, we've tried to make this uh, fairly uh, public. You've seen, received regular updates and memos on the timing of these uh, events and on different parts of the process. We have created a separate review web page, uh, which you can find easily online. This is the second of the two open community consultations. And in addition to this, we've been and will be uh, meeting with a variety of bodies to talk about the review. Uh, we've had some brief conversations with deans and chairs, but we'll have more intense conversations over the next little while. Um, we have uh, talked to some departments. Boise Council is meeting tomorrow, and that will be part of the conversation. Um, and we've just put the self-study document online. So um, for those of you who are interested, we put a draft of the self-study document, essentially the descriptive core. It's still missing, obviously, the, some of the analysis because that's one of the objectives here is to have community consultations that will lead to us framing this with comments at the beginning and the ending. But for the most part, the self-study core is already online. So in terms of how to get involved beyond this, thank you very much for coming and participating in this session. We'll be talking with FAC, with OISE Council tomorrow um, in a meeting that takes place at 3 o'clock, the regularly scheduled meeting of the OISE Council. Um, as I said, the draft of the review document itself has been online, went online last week. And you're welcome to submit ideas and comments on any aspect of the review or its process. Um, and that uh, you can do that through the dean at OISE at utoronto.ca. And finally, many of you will probably be involved with a site visit uh, in January. Certainly those of you with administrative positions will be involved. Others will be invited, I'm sure, to, to participate in, in small group conversations. Um, we don't control that process. That's obviously a provostial review. So the provost decides the agenda for that. Um, but I think it's a fairly open process as it moves along. So that's the broader context. And let me then turn it over to Doug McDougall to talk about programs and those issues. Great, thank you, Glenn. And it is my pleasure to talk today about programs and the program portfolio. Uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about who we are and what we do, provide a little bit of an overview of the scope of the work that we do in the program's office, as well as giving us a chance to think about some of the initial thoughts that we have in our transition only four months ago. And I'm new in this role. The other two sitting at this podium are new in this role. I would like you to put up your hand if in the last six months or so you're in a new role or in a new title. Okay. So at least half of you had your hands up to say, I'm in something new. And that's part of all of us are trying to find out. We're in some things that are new. And the nice thing about having new is it gives us an opportunity to think a little bit about what we're doing and why we do the things we do. So, for example, I just wanted to note a few things of what's changed. So we have a new dean and two associate deans. As Glenn introduced earlier, there are three out of the four chairs are new, although they've had similar roles. Um, the Associate Dean Program staff, there are three or four people that have left, and there's a number of people who are new. The Office of the Registrar and Student Services has finally merged together, and they have a number of changes, and they're still trying to build their community. Education Commons is still adding a few more to their complement so that they can get to their full strength. But again, we're four months past the starting point, and they're still building. We have staff and departments, and a number of you I noticed and know uh, put your hands up when you said you had a new role, a new title. And that's because in some and many of the departments, there are new staff, almost 100% in some places. The communications office is almost all sitting over here, and they're almost relatively new, and they're still building their community. And then in finance, there are new people, and facilities, there are new people. And in fact, in every part, of this, of our new OISE, we have new people. And what that brings is, as I said to you, new ideas, but also to build the collective knowledge that may be lost and how do we build on that. So I wanted just to give a little bit of a background. Because we see this as a review, we should go back in some cases and take a look at what's happened over the last five years. So I'll start with teacher education because we had five pathways. Notice that we have the undergraduate bachelor of education, we had the consecutive, the Technological Education Program, and the CTEP, or the Concurrent Program. And we also had our two graduate programs, the Master of Teaching and the Master of Arts and Child Study Education. And in those cases, we had a number of students, and I'll show you a little bit how many students we had, and that's what we looked like five years ago. I want to just bring you up to date then on what's changed a little bit. So in OISE, we had a strategic plan. We focused a little bit on how we might realign initial teacher education and graduate teacher education, 
how do we get the number of people involved that uh, we had these two different groups that were not necessarily working too well together. In, next year, we reorganized departments. We went from five departments to four departments. That caused some reorganization of what was happening in those departments. But in addition to that, we also went through a review from the two uh, UTCAP reviews of all the, grow the programs. Then the next year, we had a task force on teacher education, what we were going to do with the Bachelor of Education. It was held solely in the dean's office, but we had integration across different departments and how do we get faculty involved. The following year, we had a working group on teacher education leading into a graduate teacher education proposal that was part of our strategic um, mandate uh, agreement that we had with the university and uh, the Ministry of Education and the uh, Ministry of Colleges and Universities Training. Final year then, it was this past June, is that the B. Ed. Consecutive and the TIAP program, they ended and we continued with uh, CTEP. Throughout all of this time, there was also an Ontario context that was taking place. And uh, 10, 11, the government reduced the number of funding spaces by 850 over the next three years. In addition to that, the next year, as they said, that we were going to lengthen the teacher education program to two years. Now, that didn't have an effect really on our Master of Teaching and MACSE programs. They were already two years, but it had a major difference in what our Bachelor of Education programs were going to look like. The following year, there was going to be a change in what the Enhanced Teacher Education program looked like, what were the elements, what were the characteristics, what were the new learning that had to take place, and that also fed into um, taking a look at this accreditation. We then, uh, then the OCT issued this new accreditation manual a number of us were at meetings about it, and there, there were new qualification registration uh, uh, regulations, including the change from 40 days to 80 days of practicum, and that had a number of uh, changes and, and effects on our programs. So, in addition to what was going on in the Ontario context, is that they changed the funding formula so that there was a 32% decrease in the amount of uh, funds that were going to go to each of the Bachelor of Education students. And uh, if you were here last uh, presentation or get a chance to go back and take a look at it, Helen had a really good description of what was going on at that time about the financial component. But besides just giving you the very quick version of that, that resulted in a $3 million decrease in our operating funds coming from the ministry and from different sources. So that meant that we were going to have to make a number of changes. And so looking at the enrollment, you'll see that there are the three lines. The blue line is the Bachelor of Education. And in 2008-9, it was about 1,300 students. And you can notice that there was a steady decrease so that in 2014-15, in this last year, it was down around 800, 750, 800, 900 in that range. The second line is the red one, which is CTEP. Notice that it started very about 2008-9. It very quickly increased. And then it got to 2011-12, and it's just leveled off for a while. And then there was a big drop because that was about the time when we stopped the admissions into CTEP. And the last line, the one on the bottom of the grad programs, the MACSE program and the MT program, starting around 200, a very steady state for a very long time. And then a couple of years ago, we started to increase the Master of Teaching program. That changed then. So this ended, this graph is really just to show you up to the end of 2014-15. If we take a look at 2015-16, this current year, we'll see that the blue line Bachelor of Education is at zero. There is no blue line. The red line is continues to decrease down to about, uh, the CTEP this year is down probably 180, 190. And that's from even the year before where it was at 800. Uh, sorry, that's uh, 180, 190 for each of the three last remaining years. So it's down to about 600, I suppose. And then the line at the bottom, the green line, has started to increase because we took in about 250 sorry, 350 new MT students this year, which resulted in an increase to about 550 in that program and about 150 uh, or so in this MACSE program. So um, as we move forward, we have these, this teacher education program that is fully graduate, and uh, what are some of the characteristics? So here's what eventually happened. We suspended the admissions to CTEP. We are now taking what we call combined programs with our CTEP partners. We have one of those signed already We're between uh, the Faculty of Music and the MT program where the students are admitted conditionally in year three 
And then in year four, they will be taking a couple of courses from the MT program in advance of, of the actual entry into the program. And then at the end of year four, they'll get their um, clear offer of admission if they meet the criteria, and they'll enter into the program in the September. And uh, they'll have two fewer courses, 18 rather than 20, but they will then be assured of admission, admission into the program. We're working with other partners that are CTEP partners for the same thing with the M and the MCSE so that the students there can have um, advanced um, access to some of our programs here through a conditional program. Uh, you'll notice that we've increased the teacher education from 220 students is what we had in the past. In order to involve faculty from other departments, there was a, a move towards electives in the MT program called areas so that the faculty have opportunities to to have students in their regular classes that are empty students or to have empty student courses that fit in the different departments and the, and the goals that they have there. Uh, in addition to all of these things happening is that we have an accreditation process going on as well. And so a number of the, the uh, uh, faculty involved here is that there's a verification program report that is due in March of 2016 which essentially says, are we doing what we said we're supposed to do without any real evidence, just with some documentation. But then almost at the same time, starting in January until December, we'll need to put together a full accreditation report for the Ontario College of Teachers. And we'll have some reviewers and a panel come here in late November uh, or so in 2016 to take a look at the programs that are in the middle of a of implementation, just to get a sense of the kinds of things that we're doing. So that just gives us a sense of the kinds of things in teacher education. In graduate programs, we have quite a number of things happening as well. So over the past number of years, we've settled on 12 programs, just identify them here for you. And there are five degrees that our students can take. We had a, a wonderful week last week, I think, because we had open house uh, for four days and then on Saturday, where we invited students to learn more about our programs. But as we go on, we want to learn more about our programs and what we offer. So here are two departments and the other depart two departments, and each of them have some ideas of where they want to go next. How do they build different degrees or new degrees? How do they modify the degrees that they have? And so part of what we want to be able to do over the next little while is to think about what are some of the changes that they would like to make and how can we support that in the Associate Dean Programs Office. There are uh, some enrollment figures that we have available. So this takes us back to 2007, 2008, where we had about 2,000 students. And you'll notice that over that time, there's been some changes. Uh, we went up in 2010, 11, 11 uh, so, we were up to above 2,000. We've dropped down a little bit the last few years. Now we're working our way back up. But you'll notice that the blue line, which is our full-time students, has been increasing, and the number of part-time students we have is decreasing. And so as we look forward, we want to think a little bit about, is that the right measure of full-time, part-time? Are there other students that we want to, in, to invite to our programs, to change our programs? And so the departments have started that conversation. In addition to all of these things, the key to the programs of what's happening and the work that's happening in associate team programs is really about the student experience. And so part of what we're working on now is how do we support the student experience through the offices that we have in place now uh, at OISE. So one of the things that have happened over the last five years is that there have been a number of student surveys. Uh, in some cases we get the documentation, in other cases it has gone to other places, school graduate studies, but we've learned a few things about what the students want. And But however, there are some gaps in the, the documentation, the information, the data that we've collected, and so part of what we want to look forward to in the future is what data do we need and how can we collect that so it'll help us make some good decisions. Another area of supporting is student funding. And so student funding over the last few months, as many of you know, have been a little bit uneven in the whole process, partly because almost all of the people who were doing student funding in the past are gone, and we've now started to take a look at a number of things about student funding. But this becomes 20 to 25% of OISE's budget. So it's really important for us to think about how do we collect good data, how do we organize our data, how do we make sure the departments and other units have that information, and how can we share it. And, that, and that's part of what we've started now, and it's going to be a big thing over the, the rest of this year and, and further on. 
Another part of, of supporting student experience is that either the students we have now or the students we want in the future need to have good documentation and the place they go is the website. And so we find some areas where we have some websites that are a little bit out of date, some we have that are a lot out of date. We have some where we don't have maybe all the information we know. And that's why we're really excited about our, our communications team and our focus on recruitment so that we can start to bring some of those things together. And also the other part, which is a, a really exciting part, uh, is the bringing together of the, the Office of the Registrar and Student Services and having it so that there's a one place for our students to go for the most part to gather the, what it is that they need and how can we support the rest of the departments and what's going on there. Um, so those are the things, of course, that have, are, are what we're focusing on. So there are some emerging ideas, some things that we wanted to think a little bit about just going forward to, to share with you, but um, to invite you to be part of it. The first part is about recruitment. And we had a number of th things in place last year about recruitment. And then we started this year with a recruitment committee and we're building as we go to add more people. But really, what are the, the key elements of recruitment and what does it look like? How do we work internally so that we are gathering the right information, the right people have it? How are we working with our external partners so that they have a share with our alumni office, with our communications office, registrar's office, education commons, and the, and the people we have in the departments? But also, how do we work a little bit further into international recruitment? And so we'll be starting that later in November of bringing in expertise and ideas from you about how do we connect and, and work out with, with our external partners outside of Canada? Another one is retention. How do we keep the people and the students that we have here now? Uh, we focus a lot on targets. We focus a lot on how do we bring in new students. And we also want to focus on how do we make the experience of those students who are already here um, enjoyable and learning environments so that they want to stay and come back. And so those are the areas that we want to think about. We have some uh, departments who are starting to think about international programs and we have some exciting ones already underway that we're, we're building on that we can share as they go further and uh, again ideas of how do we connect with our international students. Another one is on online cohorts and we had uh, a number of people talk about online last year and so what we want to be able to do is think about how do we bring those people closer together um, through online cohorts. We've started some edu uh, the ED discussions. A number, all of the departments have been involved early on with the chairs and now going out to the departments. Of how do we make that uh, an exciting and and um, very positive experience, but one that matches the kind of degree that some student might want? That's a little bit different from our PhD students. Finally, we're going to build that on a, a student experience and how we might bring together people who uh, are going to share some of the ideas that they have, including students, so that we can share and learn more about the student experience. So what I wanted to do today in the, in the 15 minutes or so that I was speaking is to talk a little bit about where we come from, and that's what you'll learn a lot about if you go take a look at the details in the review already that's posted, and a little bit of the ideas because they're just emerging. We wanted people to have a voice in how to make it happen, and that the Associate Dean's Programs Office is really about support, uh, flexibility, and enabling the kinds of things that you want to happen. So as you think of those, make sure that you get a chance to let us know. We'd like to know early. Uh, the governance process that uh, haven't had a chance to talk about, we'll talk about uh, at another time, when, in fact, the, uh, sorry, OISE Council, is that we need to know early because there's a lot of processes in place to make that work. Part of it starting off with the provost's office, you know, having a heads up ahead of time to help us with the process, and then following through the great governance that we have. So we hope, look forward to some questions uh, at the end, but also looking forward to your attendance if you have a chance to come to OISE Council uh, tomorrow afternoon where we're going to continue the conversation. Okay, so next uh, to give us her uh, introduction is Michelle about research international innovation. Thank you, Doug. So everything Doug said at the end will go for for my my spiel too, which is that you know really we're sort of about trying to figure out um, you know where we've been coming from, what we're doing, uh, but also wanting very much to hear from the OISE community about uh, their thoughts and uh, ideas, suggestions, uh, and so on. Um, and so again, I just want to really talk. 
the, the focus of this is the is the OISE review, but from my perspective, it goes a little beyond that to really understanding uh, a little bit about what, what the Office of the Associate Dean Research International and Innovation does, who we are, how we support you, um, some of the kind of key activities and highlights since the last review in 2009, and again, you know, some thoughts, uh, emerging ideas, I like the way Doug put that, uh, that, that we have about uh, directions for the office, and then your thoughts about that as well. So I wanted to start just a little bit, and it may be that I'm a faculty member who's just, you know, uh, going along in my little world and didn't really, but I, I sort of felt like I didn't know exactly who, were, who was in these offices and what exactly people did. So using me as an example, so I may not be very representative of the rest of you, I thought, well, let's just start with with what this office is. And the other piece of it is, is it changed over the last five years as well, right? So Associate Dean, Research International and Innovation. Um, and so the sort of the research side of that office um, has Zara Banji, who's I'm sure uh, you do know and, and who's uh, helped and supported you and you've been in contact uh, about grants and about knowledge mobilization and so on. So she's our director. And then we have two administrative coordinator positions. Um, and so one focused on sort of research, meaning very much the sort of the tri-council side of things, uh, and then an administrative coordinator, uh, research international and innovation. Um, and so this is a, a small but mighty team of people who are wonderful. And, and I have been blessed in the sense that these folks were, were here. They're in the same job they were in four months ago. So uh, I have learned a lot from them because it's a very steep learning curve. And the other side is the continuing professional learning side that I'm oh, uh, the only person I put up there because there's a whole team uh, underneath her is Elizabeth Reese Johnstone, who's our executive director of continuing professional learning, which is another portfolio that's part of the uh, the associate dean office. Then I'll just uh, speak very briefly about. But I'm hoping that as the year kind of rolls along, you'll have more of a chance to uh, hear from Elizabeth about what's going on in continu continuing and professional learning. Uh, so just wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of, of what that office looks like. Um, so in terms of, re so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each of the, so research, international, innovation, they're each, they're different words and they're different things. And so I thought I just would kind of touch on each of those areas. Um, and so in terms of uh, research, you know, we have two kind of main, we can cut our research into two main piles or buckets. And one is our grant funded research, which is, you know, a lot of, what we do, uh, hopefully what we're all doing, so the tri-agency research uh, councils, the, the, the SHRC, CIHR, and, and NSERC, um, and we do have a history of having grants from all of those, although uh, SHRC has predominated. Um, there's also the infrastructure grants that often have been associated with uh, CRC applications, but not always, so the CFI and ORF is the Ontario kind of infrastructure part of that. Um, as well as other uh, grants, so some of the American granting um, councils. Um, and so that's the, the one bucket. And the other is research contracts, which can be another important way to get research done. So we've got provincial and federal government contract research, as well as non-governmental organizations, um, nonprofits, and, and uh, so we've got hospitals, foundations, and so on, and a little bit of uh, sort of corporate funded research that happens as well. So those are the two main ways of kind of cutting that. Um, this slide uh, tells us a little bit of our research funding story over the last uh, five years. And so what you'll see is the, the red line are, are other government grants. And that actually includes uh, things like uh, the, C, uh, the CFIs and the sort of the major um, infrastructure. Um, the tri-council is the blue line, so that's been pretty stable over the last five years. Um, and as I said, most of that's made up of uh, SHRC, but CIHRs is in there too, and that's certainly an area that we're hoping to expand on. Um, and then the, uh, the, per the sort of violet or purple line is our uh, not-for-profit, so those are that's contract research that we get uh, from outside the government sector. And then we have our little small green line, which is our, our corporate funding line. Um, but you'll see that, you know, it's been fairly steady. The blip, the, the upswing blip in 2012 uh, on, the, on the government side was our first Canair contract. So, 
okay, one of the things I have to do, I made up an acronym yesterday. It was APM because I've been at some research meetings that institutionally central research, and there are more acronyms in those meetings than you can shake a stick at. So my, my acronym was acronyms per minute. And it's just their acronyms per minute is a very, very high count. So knowledge, network, knowledge, network, of education, KN, Applied Education Research, there we go, which is a wonderful, thank you, thank you for that. Yes, um, that's what you need for this job, you need to be able to remember these things. But it's, it's a lovely tripartite agreement between U of T, Ministry of Education, and Western University, really focused around developing networks of uh, really getting evidence-based uh, practice out there. And so having um, communities of, of uh, sort of uh, researchers and people who are getting research um, the data out into out into education into the community. So that was that the, the kind of the upward blip there. Um, so insight grants. So the other thing, if we're thinking about you know metrics, what do, what do we use to sort of track how we're doing? Well, uh, certainly our our shirt grants are our that's our major uh, type of um, standard research grant funding. Um, and so here the lines are always is the blue line. So we kind of start in 2011. Kind of down low and and what you'll see on the y-axis is our percentage success rate not so great but what the good news is we've been sort of steadily increasing right um u of t is the red line so what you'll see is a nice interaction so there we are in 2011 we're kind of far away and now we're we're closer um and then nationally we're actually doing better now than the the national average so you know it's been a good news story and we have to keep at it it's been a challenging um, I think funding the you know shirk made changes and so on and in, in the way they were funding things um, but we've done a great job of kind of getting on to that and again if you look at just our shirk insight grants over time in terms of amounts and numbers of grants so the numbers there represent the numbers of uh, insight grants that we've had over the years funding's gone way up number of grants has gone up as well. So I think we're, we're getting a good handle on things. And hopefully things have changed a little bit this year. We just submitted, I believe, 22 SHRC applications went in just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and this year, uh, the total budgets have been uh, reduced from maximum of $500,000 to $400,000. And committees, I think, are being told to look at budgets, cut budgets where they need to, and basically the push is to fund more uh, proposals. Because what was happening was that, you know, well, um, that was my life, you know, not getting funded, smaller number of people getting more money. Uh, and I think they want to spread that around a little bit more. And just very quickly on the insight development grants, I mean, it's a much smaller amount, but the nice story there is that, you know, Oise's the blue line. So again, really doing a nice job of, uh, of getting more of those insight development grants. Um, so just turning from sort of some of that performance indicators, if you want to call them those, to what we do in the office in terms of providing research support. Um, there's what I would categorize as kind of general research support, a lot of focus on, on early career faculty and new faculty to OISE, trying to orient them to the, to the research landscape and, and support around thinking about planning for uh, grant applications and so on. Um, and also enhanced targeted support for grant applicants. And so Zara has been wonderful over the last number of years, really ramping up activities that are designed to spe provide specific support to applicants. And I know myself, I wrote a shirt last year and I resubmitted it again this year. And, um, you know, having the external, uh, well, the peer reviews, uh, the external consultant reviews. Uh, we had a grant writing boot camp in the middle of summer this year that some intrepid grant writers came out in July to actually sit for a day and write. So it's been it's been terrific. Uh, the budget support um, has fabulous. So Bessie, Lara, thank you. I mean, we've got great budgets, um, and that's really important. So I think that is a uh, that's a very time consuming uh, activity on the part of my office. Just really supporting uh, in terms of grant applications, but also grant administration all the way through. Um, 
There's also the institutional application side. So CRCs and CFIs are institutional applications. And so in addition to being a whole lot of work for uh, those nominees who are writing their applications, uh, they're also a whole lot of work for the people in our office in terms of providing the institutional um, parts of those application documents, budget development, um, information technology issues, space, and so on. So we had a very, very busy, intense summer with, uh, with two CRC applications and a CFI that have gone in. Uh, research contracts also uh, are very, very, um, you know, they're coming thick and fast. It's wonderful, and they take lots of management and administration as well, but we do a lot in terms of supporting those. Um, there also are these sort of more omnibus research agreements. That's how I think of them. So the vendor of record agreements. And so we have, uh, we just renewed one with the learning ministries. So Ministry of Education, MTCU. Um, so we have uh, been approved for, as a sort of a preferred vendor basically, to do research, to do evaluation, and to do knowledge mobilization. And we had our first request for proposal come out and uh, ha have somebody uh, doing an application to respond to that RFP. Similarly, uh, there's what we call the French VOR. So CREFO does research um, in terms of French language education and training. And so those are kind of agreements that um, one of my sort of focuses will be to think about how we can maybe leverage those because they take an awful lot of time to put together. We've got an awful lot of wonderful faculty uh, capacity and expertise that would be great to bring to bear in turn, under the umbrella of these um, of these agreements. Um, sort of back to metrics, I guess, for a second. Uh, this is a table that's from our self-study um, that has to do with scholarly output and basically the ranking. Now, the ranking's at the university level, so it's U of T ranking. So if we're talking about education, um, which is over here, uh, so we're number one uh, in terms of the U15 Canadian peers, North American peers in terms of publications, number one, citations, number four, all North American peers. So very strong numbers there. And those are education numbers. I think it's pretty safe to say uh, probably predominantly come from OISE, although it's the whole university. And then the other sort of main area is psychology, clinical psychology, developmental and educational psychology. Also in terms of compared to the U15, we're number one, uh, number four in publications and eight in citations uh, in our North American peers. And then up from there, very, very respectable um, uh, rankings there. Uh, we also have a number of research chairs and endowed chairs, uh, including CRCs. We have six CRCs. We have three submissions currently under review, and so I suppose we'll hear about those sometime next spring, two tier two and one tier one. Uh, we have an Ontario research chair, and he's sitting right here in the research chair right there. Um, and we have some endowed chairs. Uh, we also have a number of EDUs, extra departmental units. So we have 19 research centers and institutes which are really important um, bodies because they're hubs for collaboration within departments, across departments, across divisions, uh, and out from there. Um, and our new center since the last review is the Center for uh, the Study of Canadian and International Higher Education, and Chris Osa is the inaugural director of that center, and he's here. Uh, so that's fantastic. Uh, we are a, a shining star of, of higher education expertise, um, and so it's terrific that there's a center to represent that. And another uh, sort of major uh, institute that has uh, came, in, came into being in the, since the last review is the Fraser Mustard Institute for Human Development. Uh, we fondly call it FMIHD. Uh, rolls off the tongue nicely. And it was established in 2011, 2012. And it's situated physically here uh, at OISE, really shared uh, in a sense between um, OISE and the Faculty of Medicine, but really a lot of other units. And so one of the key things about FMIHD is the interdisciplinarity of this initiative uh, and this cross-divisional kind of work that's being done. Medicine, social work, public health, nursing, kinesiology and phys ed, and arts and science. And it's also affiliated with partner institutions and broader clusters, um, and including the Toronto Academic Health Science Network and the Aga Khan University, uh, with whom uh, U of T has a uh, memorandum of understanding. Um, and so they've been, you know, busy kind of uh, doing work. And I think in the next year, our, our will have their first review of that institute. So that sort of wraps up on the, uh, on the research side. International, um, 
we have a number of international activities going on that really are driven primarily by the interests and the initiatives of individual faculty members. So it's really sort of something that happens from the ground up. It does not happen from the, the top down. From a top down perspective, though, we know that internationalization is a presidential priority of the U of T president, Merrick Gertler. Um, and U of T has identified key priority regions. And I would say my position would be that we're mindful of the U of T priorities, but we also have our own priorities. And again, that goes back to that first point that really it has to do with uh, faculty um, interest, engagement, um, and commitment to those areas. Um, and the other thing I feel strongly about in terms of international, and this has really been my own reflection about, I guess, in the, in the first four months in my role as Associate Dean Research, you know, why is international sitting here? And to me, international really is about multiple facets of what we do institutionally at OISE that goes well beyond the, the Associate Dean Research International and Innovation Office. So certainly it has to do with research and there's lots of exciting international research going on. As Doug said, it has to do with programs as well. Um, and it also has to do very much with continuing professional learning. So really international spans across all those areas. And for me, you will see on a, a, a future slide, I really think that uh, sort of developing that international work and thinking about how those synergies can be um, uh, increased between those three, the programs, the research, and the continuing professional learning, um, I think is a great opportunity for us. Uh, so we have a number of things we do to support international research. I'm not going to go into detail on those things, but again, there's a lot of support in the Associate Dean Research Office for those things. Um, and then innovation. So again, when I was sort of learning about this role and this job, I, I wondered what innovation meant. And again, I was sort of maybe sort of naive, like doing my psychology research. And what I understand about innovation is that innovation means making money. That's what innovation means. So, um, you know, in other segments of the university, um, you know, in science and technology, STI, you're going to have, you know, people generating patents. You're going to have people selling processes or selling technologies or selling hardware, software, and so on. Um, and so what's, you know, what does Oise have to bring is something that we need to think about. Uh, and what are our sort of revenue generators if we want to think about innovation that way. And certainly the research and service contracts is one aspect of that in the sense that what we're doing is we're, we've got faculty expertise that's, you know, uh, responding to um, requests for research and service activities, um, as I said before, from governments, from non-government organizations. And the money part is that, technically speaking, 40% of those contracts should return to uh, the university broadly, and then some of that comes back to us um, as indirect costs. So that's a way of uh, generating revenue. There's uh, there's lots of indirect costs, though. There's lots of costs to doing those contracts. As I said, they're, they're time consuming to put together and so on. So we have to think about that. A lot of, probably most of our contract research doesn't actually come in at 40% overhead. Um, and the other thing is that there's a tension, right? And I would know it myself because I've done both contract research and grant research. And there's that tension. We only have so many hours in the day that we can spend. So am I spending my time doing uh, contract research, which is going to tend to be more sort of, it, you know, it's, it's somebody else uh, setting the research agenda and, and asking particular questions that, uh, that they want answered versus grant funded research where I'm initiating questions and deciding what I want to study. And so there's a tension there. But our other lovely big revenue generator is our wonderful continuing professional learning uh, unit. And so I asked Elizabeth if she would give me a couple of slides. And so I'm not going to do justice to these slides. And as I said, we need to have just a little bit of a segment, maybe at a future OISE Council meeting, where we can learn more about continuing professional learning. But really, it's that fabulous office that's providing um, different kinds of, of non-credit um, experiences for students, so including but going well beyond additional qualifications courses. And so uh, there are four different portfolios, so there's the pre-K to 12 space, as I think Elizabeth would say, post-secondary workplace learning and development and community. And, uh, you know, within either of those, we've got both what, what are called direct enrollment um, kinds of uh, courses, so that would include AQs, for example, anything where uh, we're, you know, we have students directly registering for courses with OISE, 
and then uh, closed enrollment or contract solutions. And a lot of that is international work. So again, that international comes back in uh, where we are providing contract solutions for um, whether it's consultation, uh, curriculum development, um, and so on and so forth. Training, training of teachers, and and uh, and things of that nature. And Elizabeth has some fabulous things and some wonderful irons in the fire as well um, going on. Um, so in terms of moving forward, um, so I think I would call these also emerging ideas, which is what Doug called his rather than goals. But uh, we want to obviously keep ramping up our research funding. So we want to continue our efforts to increase tri-council funding. So we need to be able to do um, effective support for faculty to, uh, to do those grant proposals and to have those uh, grant proposals succeed. We also want to support interdepartmental, interdivisional, and international research collaborations. Interdivisional research and big institutional research is, I sense, a, a much larger priority now at the university. So there's these big kind of research things going on. And you realize, I mean, OISE, we're so proud of it and it's so important to us. And then I'll go, you know, south of Bluer and one feels like a very little cog in a very big machine, let me tell you. Uh, this idea of having an international strategy where we can really um, look across research programs and continuing professional learning and really um, leverage those connections that we have, those relationships that we have to do really innovative and wonderful things in those areas and kind of cross fertilize there. Um, expanding continuing professional learning activities and revenue and just on a more sort of mundane level, but I think it does help support the work that people do is for us to continue to develop and communicate policies and processes that really enhance the effectiveness of our work. So just things that make it clear to you folks, for example, if you're thinking about doing something that's contract work, A, that you need to have come and have that contract vetted. Um, it needs to be signed on behalf of the governing council of the University of Toronto. You don't sign contracts yourself if you're doing it within the sort of umbrella of OISE. I know people do contract research on the side or work on the side, and that's a different story. Um, but we need to make this work sort of effectively and efficiently. Uh, so that's the, the sort of the quick and dirty on mine. Maybe not as quick as it should have been, but that's the way it is. Uh, and so at this point, I think we're just opening things up for questions that you may have about anything that Glenn has said, that Doug has said, that I have said, comments, suggestions, criticisms, um, you name it. So, thank you. Well, we've had two wonderful, I think, wonderfully informative presentations. It gives you a sense of the background, a sense of the kinds of changes that have taken place, a sense of the services offered in those two areas. But this is your show, so what, what kind of questions and comments do you have? I can ask you to use the microphone just over here, partly because we are webcasting, so there are people participating online, and secondly, because we are going to be archiving this, so it's important for those who watch the archive to have this. So if, if, you're, if, you're, if your boss doesn't know where you are, just keep that in mind as you're, as you're venturing forward to the microphone. Tara. Hi, thanks all three of you. And on behalf of the whole community, thank you for all the work you're doing. Um, we looked at your key priorities today, and you're doing a really great job. I feel the communication is much better. I feel like events like this really um, are genuine, and I do feel that our input um, is important to you. And I think what I want to talk about, because I thought a lot about how am I going to use this moment, is I want to talk about people. I love um, the idea that there are some new uh, emerging ideas and some um, emerging priorities coming. But I'm going to speak from what it feels like to work at OISE right now on, on the front lines. For me as a faculty, but I've been talking to a lot of people. And your people, the people who are going to be involved in retention of students, and faculty, because I'm also worried about retention of faculty. We've seen a lot of our colleagues who we never expected to leave, leave. And I don't want to see any more of my, my colleagues leave. Um, we, um, are, um, we've been talking. And I have to tell you, the, the one word that I would use to describe the lives of faculty and staff is completely overwhelmed. And uh, we've always been busy. We've always done you know, um, more with less. but. The uh, cuts that we, um, we, we did uh, were extraordinarily deep. 
And I know that there still are budget um, issues, but eventually there's going to be a better moment. Eventually, with all of those new students coming to the MT program and the MA uh, program, there will be uh, money. And I really want us to think about what is it we're going to do to regenerate our, our community in terms of uh, staff and in terms of faculty so that we have the people that we need to, to get the better funding, to uh, continue to get funding, to continue to try, to continue to run uh, research centers rather than let them close because it's just one more thing we, we can't do. A lot of my faculty uh, colleagues have said that their research productivity has declined as um, they are trying to deal with more and more students and taking on more and more students who need to be supervised because our colleagues have left. We talk about looking at more part-time students. We all know flex-time students require a lot um, more uh, uh, programming, a lot more um, support. And uh, if that's what we're going to do, we need more people to come. We need to be thinking about uh, faculty retention. We need to be thinking about new faculty recruitment. We all held our breath when Glenn's uh, message came through. We saw we got three new faculty positions. We're thrilled. Three is better than zero, but you know, lots of us feel that we needed uh, 10 more yesterday just to cope with the amount of supervision. Students who don't get the um, kind of supervision they need are students who leave. It focuses on uh, retention. It really is about the people. Our staff, I've never seen our staff work so hard, but there are only so many hours in the day, and things that are crucially important that need to be done are simply not getting done. Um, folks are, are um, finding it hard to get people paid. Uh, everything seems to be much more difficult, and it's not because our staff isn't able to do the best they can. They're doing the best we can. We've lost too many people. So as we're thinking ahead, we really need a place in the process to think about how we're going to um, get more people. The cuts were extremely deep. Did they need to be that deep? I don't know. But that's not helpful. But what's helpful is we need to regenerate. And none of this is going to be possible unless we begin to work on that together. So I want us to think about uh, people and, and labor. And uh, we can't move into the future, I don't think, unless we're going to be able to, to uh, increase our community. So thanks. Those are excellent comments, Tara. Just a, a few, a few um, uh, comments in response. I mean, I, I, I think um, the, the group I particularly feel with right now are our staff uh, throughout the building, um, because I think that, that those were the real serious cuts, um, and it's on two levels. One, one is, is the nature of the cuts, and the second is the fact that there's been so much movement, um, individuals in new positions, and just tremendous change in a short period of time. So, so I, I think that we have to be very mindful of the fact that we are Within the building, uh, we have we have many staff who are in positions that were not the situations they were in six months ago. Uh, people are learning new jobs. Uh, there, there are new process changes that were created in order to create greater efficiencies. So, to some extent, it's a kind of perfect storm of change. Um, I, I think on the other side of the storm, uh, there are all kinds of possibilities. We have wonderful people in this building, and we have wonderful staff. So, so part of this, I think, is a kind of space that we need to create, recognizing that people are. Are, are learning their jobs. Uh, they're, they're in new situations, in, new, in building new communities, to use Doug's phrase. And, and so I, I think at the other end of the storm, uh, it will, will be at least a greater sense of stability and all kinds of possibilities. And we have some very excellent staff. So, so I'm, I'm optimistic, but it's a difficult time. I completely understand that. In terms of the other points you raised, I guess the, the, what I would suggest is that I, I think following this year and following this review, what we desperately need at OISE is an academic plan. So we need a process that will lead us to, to create, not just at the decanal level, but at the local department level, um, some, you know, to ask some difficult questions about what it is we're doing, what it is we want to do, whether we're organized appropriately for it, whether the programs that we have are the right programs, given our new sense of, the, of the, what students are looking for and asking for. I mean, I, I think to be, to be realistic, we're not in a situation where we're going to be seeing a huge number of new faculty members come to OISE. That's not our financial circumstance. Um, it could be 10 years from now, but it's not our near future. So the notion, I think, is really to create a situation that's sustainable, uh, where we don't have cuts, and to create a situation where, where we're, 
we're using our resources as efficiently as possible, and then maybe even we have to change workloads. We talked about it a little bit before. Maybe maybe we're too top heavy in terms of doctoral students, which is a source of stress. But if we're if we're going to make those decisions, then we have to find other sources of revenue. So it's a, a complicated decision, but I think it's a time for us to rethink who it is we want to be, and and what it is we want to be as an institution. And I think that's quite exciting, um, uh, but it is I think that time. Anyways, a, quick, a few quick comments. Others may want to, to jump in. Sure. My guess is it's probably towards the spring. Um, I, th I think it realistically it has to be after a decision about a dean. It has to be under the new leadership of that of that dean. So so I, I think it would be unrealistic to suggest that we're we're not in a position to start that process at this point. Um, but you know this this is all part of that. In other words, this review process itself I think will lead to a series of suggestions about some key issues that we think should be taken up in that academic review. The external review process will contribute to that conversation. So. So I, I think it's all part of a broader process, but I think I think the academic planning process has to to, to be established under the new leadership. Okay. Yeah, please. yeah, I just want to add a few things. Thanks, Tara, for your comments, because I think they actually uh, help us think of three different things that have gone on here. The first is the actual reorganization. So what happens through a reorganization is that we think that we have the right people in place and we put them in place, but what happens? is that there are gaps. There, we have 30, approximately 30, 25, 30 fewer people here. So what they were doing before will generate gaps. I think we have to go through a, almost a year cycle to identify what the gaps are, what we know and what we don't know, so that we can fill them as quickly as we can. And sometimes we don't know until something comes up to us and says, oh, have you done this? No, we didn't even know we had to do that. And I think that was the purpose of putting our hands up of who's new and who in a new role, because we have to treat each other that way. We're in a new role. If there's something we haven't done or we haven't thought about, somebody has to say, have you thought about this so we can help each other through? I think the second is that rebuilding takes time and it takes lots of time. And so we, we look after each other and as we've all done so far and we continue to do, which is we know that we, it's going to take some time and we want to generate some of that time for us. The third one I think that's really the key to all of this is that to build a community, we need to make sure that people have a voice. And in order to give people a voice, we want to make sure that people have a chance to be around the table so they can give their ideas. And so as we rebuild that, that's also going to take us time because we want to bring the right people and make some thoughtful decisions about making any kinds of changes in processes. And, and as Glenn has said, you know, even having an academic plan. If we had an academic plan, we could point to it and say, well, we're going to follow this. But we're still doing that at the same time as, as moving forward. So. I think for all of us, it's really important that we do have voice, that we have these opportunities for people to say, this is what we should do in recruitment, this is what we should be doing in research, this is what we should be doing in focusing on student experience, and that's what we're trying to do. So we know it'll take time and there'll be some gaps, but we think it's really important, as I know you do. Who's next? You can't tell me everybody's happy with everything. Now, come on, this is easy. Yeah, please. Do you mind going to the? Do you mind going to the, the uh, microphone, please? That's all right. We got lots of time for you. You have to tell us what you did to yourself. It's one of the. Oh, I had surgery. I'm sorry. To hear that. That's okay. Um, yes, I just wanted to know, moving forward, what the supports might be for more online only courses and flex mode courses, if we're going to be thinking about taking more students. Um, I've had great support from Ed Commons in the past, but I know they're quite short staffed now. Um, I'm just wondering what you're thinking looking forward for online courses. I don't, I don't know if, if Doug's given, would you want to have a, have a chance? I, I have a few thoughts, but you go ahead. I'll start a little bit just on the online. So we do have one department that's focusing on uh, building an online cohort, and we're supporting that in whatever way we can. So in terms of the programs, we have the government's, the, sorry, the governance um, documentation in place to make that happen. Uh, there was an online community that was, uh, that uh, an online committee that met last year, had a number of recommendations. So it's a good idea for us to review those recommendations to take a look at it. Um, 
fully face to face, -face flex time online are all delivery modes that we think are important that we should be supporting. So in terms of the program perspective, it's really key for us to look at what we're doing and how we might do them differently or, or better in a delivery mode. But the Education Commons one is a, another one I think perhaps Glenn will talk about. Yeah, I mean, I, my sense is the Education Commons is, has, has the capacity to continue to play that function. There, there's, there are some serious staff issues right now in Education Commons, like others, because they've they, they particularly have been hard hit, um, and and um, and they're not up to capacity, which I think is the challenge right now. Is they have quite a number of positions they're still filling. So so when they're back up to capacity, I think they'll be in a, in a situation where they can support a lot of this activity. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of interesting um, initiatives taking place. You've mentioned the, the Flex initiative that you folks have done, and you're you're getting ready to, to have another uh, Flex PhD cohort, I think, for next year. Um, there's a wonderful experiment taking place now with a a pilot program for Aboriginal First Nations principles um, that's been done entirely online with an initial arrangement and with using new technology and the Ed Commons has done a wonderful job. So we've got these interesting initiatives. I think part of this is is increasing awareness of the various platforms and technologies available and what it actually means and can do. So I, I think the, the notion moving forward at some point, and I'm not talking about the next few months because I think there's just a lot of stuff happening, but as part of, perhaps as part of the academic planning exercise, a series of conversations about the possibilities that, uh, in terms of this, so it becomes part of the, the departmental conversations, I think might be useful. The, as I said, that some of the technologies we have now are, are really quite outstanding, and, and I think it would be relatively easy to do certain kinds of, of things using online technology. There are expensive startup costs if we want to go farther along the line, and I think, but, but I think that's a strategic decision that we have to make as a group because I think there are some possibilities. I can imagine certain kinds of courses being offered in ways that decrease actual faculty workload, um, but actually, you know, but, but, but uh, uh, let us connect with a larger number of students. And I've seen the way that some of these technologies are used, and we're not talking about a second-rate experience, we're talking about a first-rate experience. So if we can use, a, you know, spend the investment into a first-rate educational experience in a way that decreases faculty workload but allows us to sustain large numbers of students that that's a kind of win-win-win and the notion is is can we find ways where that might work that fits into the academic program because everything has to be grounded in our our academics and our research um, but in a way that kind of creates efficiency for the organization so so I, I I'd like to see that kind of conversation take place as part of our academic planning exercise and we'll get there but a great question and sorry about the foot. Who's next? Kathy. I have yeah, my thanks that we're even having this conversation. That's a great improvement and gives me hope. Um, I have the sense that the squeeze we're under now in terms of uh, really radical cuts to staff and incremental but just as radical cuts to faculty uh, in certain areas, in particular, uh, expansion in some kinds of student populations and not others has had some pretty serious costs in relation to diversity and equity, right. in terms of representation on the faculty, in terms of sharing steep workloads across the faculty, and in terms of support, particularly for our part-time students. Uh, we're talking about taking more because there are budgetary reasons to do that, but uh, those students require resources to be educated well. And we have a lot to learn before we're going to do a good job with that. And in case that's not enough to respond to, let me raise one more. Uh, in addition to uh, being a member of the Curriculum Teaching and Learning Department, I'm a member of the Comparative International and Development Education Program. That program, like other collaboratives here, does not have a seat at the table. It doesn't sit at deans and chairs. It's not represented in the budget conversations that happen at the department level or the dean's office level. And I could list them, but I guess you can figure out that we've lost almost all of our international comparative focused staff. Lots of people do work that has a little bit of international in it and even have an affiliation, an indirect affiliation with society. But in terms of core faculty uh, in a space that's been a major source of innovation for the world and for OISE, uh, people have died, left, or gone on leave for at least
least three years at a time. And I don't even know how to get on the agenda when I hear you say we might start hiring in 10 years. And I know I haven't been able in my little world to impact those conversations about of all our huge needs, which ones could be international versus all the other needs. It's, it's really discouraging and I don't see how we can do all this globalization work in a globalized world without uh, being better informed and more inclusive and more equitable. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree with you more. A couple of comments. Again, I, that's, this isn't designed to be a kind of um, uh, a thing where we have all the solutions. I mean, the idea is really for us to listen and to do that. But this, a couple of comments and response. Uh, the first is, is um, I think the situation in terms of student numbers is very different from department to department. And so I, I do think we need a, to, as, as part of a, a future, conver as we continue our conversations, the notion of ensuring the departments are aware of where, you know, there are some departments who have tremendous expertise in some of these areas and working with part-time cohorts and in working with arrangements. There are others who have tremendous expertise in terms of the use of technology and flex arrangements. But I don't think there's been much horizontal sharing. And so the notion of, of conversations that work across, because I think we have a lot to learn from each other on issues of student success and on some of these arrangements. So I think that's, that's part of the conversation. I couldn't agree with you more in terms of the discussion about internationalization and the, the, the notion of maintaining a very strong uh, international comparative perspective. I, I want to make sure that when I said, I didn't say that we weren't going to be hiring for 10 years. I said that, that I, I think the notion of, of expecting uh, complement growth on our faculty is not a short term notion. If, 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 if things work well, we can sustain our current numbers and, and that's, that would be a kind of short term wonderful thing. Um, if we have gr broader strategies to expand, that would take us a while. I guess that's the point I wanted to make on that. I think, again, if we think of it in the context of international, of, a, of an academic plan, the notion of what is our role in terms of international comparative scholarship. And I think Michelle asked the, the really interesting question about whether or not we need a kind of international strategy. And it's not just a strategy about, about faculty and programs. It's also, I think, about linking our other activities. It's about research. It's about creative and professional learning. It's about recruitment of international students. And thinking of that more, co more, more coherently, I think, makes a great deal of sense to me. So it's a great question. I don't have the answers, but I think we can think about an approach that might at least facilitate that conversation. Normal. Yes, sir. I, I just uh, came in. I was at the conference, so maybe you already addressed that. But we addressed all the important questions <laughs> before. No, no. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if we if, uh, will uh, uh, think about uh, transforming the, uh, the way of delivery, uh, delivery of the programs. I, I can think of a couple of things. Uh, for example, we uh, accept very little uh, MA students now, yeah. and uh, they, I think they, uh, they are supposed to move on to the PhD degree. So can we uh, consider more possibilities for direct entry in the, into the PhD from the MA? Right. Uh, uh, so that's one thing. The other is uh, uh, we've been talking about the pressure on workload and everything. Uh, now the uh, graduate courses at OEZ are three hours a, a week. Right. As on the campus, it's uh, two hours, or it was two hours uh, when I was involved. Uh, is, is this something we would consider now that we, we teach all at the graduate level, uh, the, the courses? The other thing is all the reflection that has been done in uh, as in the, the world about the PhD, the changing nature of PhD, uh, the work done by the group of eight in Australia, uh, the work done by the Modern Language Association in the U.S., uh, where uh, I think uh, people take stock of the uh, transformation of society, of research, of the uh, uh, massification of higher education, more people coming out with PhD degrees on the market and finding jobs elsewhere from the academia, uh, the need for quick response to uh, issues uh, where students involved in research uh, are supposed not to take seven years to find a solution to an eventual problem, but to come quick with solutions if they work for a ministry or, or work for an organization. So uh, there, there is a lot of reflection elsewhere on uh, how to transform the PhD so that it adapts to those new realities. So I don't know if we want to enter into that discussion as well to, as a way to relieve the, the workload pressure and to also attract students to make sure we have also uh, equity in terms of uh, uh, um, admitting students with different kinds of backgrounds that may not have the same profile that those had in the past when they came for a PhD and, and had six years they could spend here in, in the building. So that's, those are excellent points. Thank you very much, Norma. I'm not sure if you want any comments. Yeah, the thing I would add to the discussion is I know some of the departments are beginning to rethink the EDD. Um, in other words, I think there is room for a, a conversation about the PhD because there is a, um, 
I mean, there's always a room for a conversation about programs, right? About, about whether or not we are doing what we want to accomplish, whether or not the program itself is meeting the requirements of our students who move either into academic careers or into the broader professional society. Um, I know a number of departments have, have been rethinking the EDD, which in some cases has been put aside in the context of the Flex PhD. But the notion of maybe we need to rethink that. Maybe, maybe there is, because especially as a, something that might attract international students, the notion of, of, a, of a professional doctorate that is far less uh, intensive in terms of supervision of research that, that would take us, that have a very different niche market that might, for example, be something that extends beyond the MT. So an MT into something like a, a new kind of ED would be another kind of possibility. So I think, I mean, my, my own sense is it's, it's, it's time for a lot of these conversations to take place, and those are excellent questions. Claire. Um, hi. Yes, thanks for having this uh, session today. It's, it is very good. It's nice to all sit here and talk to one another in a sure. kind of convivial uh, way. But there are some very um, important uh, issues, and I think everyone here who's spoken has spoken to um, important ones. One of the ones that a couple that have been, um, I've been thinking about, one is, is the issue of centers. Right. We really have to get our ducks in a line with the centers. Like, what are they? Why, you know, if we're not going to fund them, it's really a problem. As, as the director of the SMT Center now, with, with no money, um, <clears throat> and I am on sabbatical, which speaks to the workload issue. Um, what you know, what, you can't. We, we don't want to let these things fall. They're really important. These are our relationships. I mean, like the SMT Center, for example, uh, we have really good connections with with departments at U of T, and I want to keep that. We have a new collaborative program, the connecting with engineering. We have to keep those things going, and we want to provide our students with opportunities, and we're trying to do that, but it's really hard to do that with no administrative support. And what message does that send? You know, so I don't even know where, I mean, I understand there are always budget issues, but, you know, we do have to sort of spend some time thinking about how to how to deal with that issue and what what we want to do, um, you know, with that part of it. The other, the, my other um, concern is, is, um, is around, uh, yes, is, is online learning, obviously, and, and technology, related issues and the relationship with education commons and I know that they've undergone enormous changes but I feel like there's it's a sort of black hole now um, I don't know who does what nobody tells us anything we need to I would really like us to get back to having a situation where we could have those conversations that we were talking about earlier um, uh, that with Jan raised, um, but have them together. We certainly need to do them across departments, but we also need to do them with Ed Commons. And Ed Commons, as far as I understand, got rid of many of the people who did that work with us before. So it's not clear to me that the people who are coming in necessarily have those skills because that wasn't something that anyone was really listening to before. So really to have um, to have a discussion, to have a kind of, I don't know, an advisory board around online learning to maybe continue that um, uh, the committee that I was actually on that last year that, you know, to make, that made some suggestions which then fell into a hole. So, you know, moving it on those things I think is really important for us to do all of these interesting kind of program opportunities that, that are kind of coming up for us. So that will do for now. Those are, those are excellent suggestions, excellent comments. Uh, Doug has talked about the notion of creating a kind of student success committee. Um, we've, we've played around with different names. We've talked about the same thing of a kind of educational technology committee again, as a kind of users group that would provide an interface between the education commons and the broader community. Um, I, I think it's it's probably something we would think about doing in the new year. Again, we've just, we've just got this pace of change, and I think we have to be very mindful of timing and people's commitment and space. But I think those are excellent ideas. Yes, Ruth. Um, I really appreciate the, uh, the chance to have this conversation. And and I've been, I've been trying to think, I mean, I. I keep thinking of the the comparison to you know trying to to turn the Queen Mary in a bathtub, right? I, I get it that that um, a lot of these things take take time. These are longer conversations, and, and you um, haven't seen my bathtub, so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and 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 you know, I, I think there there is um, a lot of goodwill around around taking part in those conversations, but but I've been trying to think like what are the things that we can do or not do this year. Right, that that we you know we can't just say we need to put it off. We need to have more conversations, and and one of the things that, that really has been troubling me, I think every or almost everybody has referred to the fact that 
the fiscal pressures, and this is reflected in your report, which I really appreciate all the tables and figures and so forth. It very clearly shows that the fiscal pressures have been pushing down the number of faculty at the same time that they've been pushing up or maintaining the number of students, right? And I, I think we're, we're feeling that all in in many ways. And, and I take it, I get it that we're not going to change the faculty situation anytime soon, and even necessarily the proportions of students. But but I, I, I guess I just wonder if there's room this year to consider lower targets or more flexibility about targets. Um, my sense working in a number of different programs around the building is that um, there's been a tremendous amount of of work and again goodwill put into trying to meet those targets over the last number of years. Um, and we also know, and I think this comes up when we talk about equity, we know that some of the students that we've taken in feeling that we must take them in to meet the targets, we actually haven't been able to set them up for success and support them in the way that we would like to. Um, and so that's something we're going to be taking in another group of students. We're going to be making those decisions February to April. Um, can we at least have some conversations about not continuing to perhaps reach deeper into the pool than we think we can actually support? Yeah. Those, those, are, those are difficult conversations um, and difficult discussions. Um, one, one of the challenges is, and I think we talked about this a little bit at the last meeting, one of the challenges is that we've, we fell quite short of our targets this last year. Um, and I think there are a variety of reasons for that. Uh, the year before, we did quite well. Um, and I think uh, OISE had a kind of break-even situation. Um, but this particular year, um, the one that we're in, uh, uh, OISE had a planned de deficit of $2.5 million because of the staff changes that were taking place. We have at least another two to $2.5 million in deficit because of our failure to make the targets for this last year. Um, and that was that was uh, you know that wasn't isolated. Almost every program, I think, with one exception, uh, missed their targets by quite a bit. Um, it was just not a good year. And and so the notion is that right now, if we don't do anything, um, we have essentially a four million dollar deficit. Um, and so that we we really do have to essentially meet the targets that we have created for ourselves. Um, it's not just a, it's it's without that we essentially will not be able to replace any faculty at all. So, so that, that's, that's the reality of this. It doesn't mean that in the longer term we can't rethink and find targets that will work for us in ways that, that, are, are, you know, that, that allow for some displacement, that allow for changes in workload. But given our current situation, I, I think we really need to kind of uh, continue to push for the targets that, that you know, we, we've had conversations with departments, departments have had conversations with us. Um, we're trying to get, the tar to get a set of targets that make sense in terms of both the departments and, and the center recognizing the challenges of this. But, you know, if you're the provost, uh, unless OISE has a break-even budget, you, you, you can't imagine approvals for new hires. Um, and, and that's not where we're, where we're at. So that's why we've, we're trying our very best to work for the targets. We're waiting to find out now what the targets we've created for this year, what it translates into, into dollars and cents. We haven't had that information. Um, it's a particularly bad year for us because it's not only, keep in mind that, that when you, if you don't meet a PhD target, it's not just one year, it's four years worth of money in the budget that disappears, right? And so it's, it's, it is really challenging. And every time you don't meet the MT, it's not a single year, it's two years worth of money because of the way the MT is funded. And so we, the fact that we didn't meet our MT targets, the fact that we didn't meet uh, our targets across the board, and it's, you know, we have new leadership. It's not, it's, it's, it's not about blaming anybody. Um, but it's just a, it's it's not a good situation. So so we if, if we're going to move forward, we really have to be very cognizant of our enrollment because our enrollment is where our money is. To be quite frank with you. Yeah, Lisa. Um, I'm also grateful for this opportunity uh, to to have this discussion. I want to make three points, which I think are related, although they may not appear to be on the surface of it. The first is that um, I run a, um, a flexible PhD program and I'm still getting inquiries about people wanting to do that, not because it's a community college leadership PhD program, but because it's flexible delivery. Um, and I think the key to doing this is to guarantee students that they can complete a program flexibly. And we can't do that um, at the moment and that that doesn't necessarily have to be high tech. Um, it can be just simply on the basis of compressed mode delivery. Um, and if we could guarantee that, 
that people could do an M8 or something like that in that mode, I'm sure that that would increase our numbers from um, across, across the country. Now, related to that is I think that we need a more holistic um, conception of workload. I don't think we have one at the moment uh, because it seems to me that the PhD supervision is not considered part of workload um, and that it needs to be because um, that, to me, that is the most difficult part of my job. Um, and trying to work out how we're going to supervise all these students we've taken in um, is something that's causing great anxiety given the staffing um, reduction. So we have to holistically think about our workloads and include PhD supervision as teaching um, in some way um, to be able to have a sustainable future, I think. The third thing is, and this is, this is probably the most courageous thing I'm going to say, um, is I think we, we need to think about how to meet the staffing challenge in a creative way without undermining um, tenure or, um, or union conditions or anything like that. But we, we do need to think of innovative approaches, otherwise our students' needs aren't going to be met and we're not going to be able to teach them. And one thing that um, strikes me here um, is the very limited opportunities we have for postdocs in general. Um, but in particular, it may be worthwhile us thinking about the notion of postdoc teaching positions for a couple of years, which would give our best graduates from PhDs the opportunities to build their CVs, uh, which is what they need to do if they're able to get um, jobs in other institutions, including our own. That's a very interesting idea. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions, comments? Are we running out of steam? Well, if so, perhaps we'll draw it to a close. Um, a number of you have thanked us for this presentation. I want to thank you um, because uh, it's, it's one thing to, uh, to get up the nerve to do this, it's another to have a full audience. So thank you very, very much for coming. Thank you very much for your thoughtful questions, because this only works once again if you engage us. Um, and we very much appreciate the conversation. And your, your comments will play a role as we, as we think about how to, to draft the final sections of this report and how to move forward with an academic planning exercise. So thank you very much for your contributions to this very important process. Good afternoon, folks.